Live from the Washington, D.C. area, all empowered citizens need to know about intelligent use of resources, smart governance, inclusive communities, smart industry, and healthy, thriving urbanization. This is Smart Sustainability, the TV talk about shaping a sustainable future in the digital age with Nicolette Stividar. Welcome to Smart Sustainability tonight. Another COVID storm already waiting under our wings? No worries, we're not a fear-mongering show. Quite the contrary, in fact, we want to look at our natural defense mechanism, your very own body's immune system. What role does it play? What does it respond to? How can you strengthen and support it in its natural role? helping you stay healthy and hopefully keeping disease away. Our topic tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Nicolette Dividar. When COVID hit two years ago, our immediate response, at least for most of us, was to look at drugs, vaccines, and chemicals for help that can be used to defend us. At least it was the first go-to. We turned to external authorities, mainly public health officials, while completely neglecting our body's own response system forgetting even that we have one and omitting what we could possibly do to boost our immunities versus just taking drugs and chemical connections with yet unknown long-term consequences. Now, that has many reasons. Some are because we know very little about our immune system and what critical role it plays in our bodies. The other, because there was a concentrated effort to undermine and even ignore natural body responses in favor of pharmaceutical invention. Now that's not a conspiracy theory, but even for objective people that were open to both supporting our immune system and medical intervention, the push to just drugs and lack of logic was startling obvious. Some countries went so far that homeopathic doctors got so-called love letters from their government forbidding them to inform clients about the body's own immune system and possible reactions. Germany, for example, was such a country. Today things have changed a bit in the US as well as overseas. There has been an acknowledgement to varying degrees as to natural immunities and vaccine effectiveness. So today, we want to dive a bit into the body's immune system in an effort to understand its function, what role it plays, what strengthens or weakens it, and how we can possibly understand its language. So when there is another wave or something new or similar, we start off trusting a bit more in what we have, the relationship to our own immune system, and understand how it fits into the overall medical landscape, because it's not really an either or approach. So joining me tonight is Dr. Sarah Giardinelli, naturopathic doctor and acupuncturist, who is president of the Virginia Association of Naturopathic Physicians, she focuses on integrative and environmental medicine. And also joining us is Brian Keenan, a naturopathic doctor and research writer who focuses on combining what's called evidence-based medicine with clinical and historically used medicine. He's also a practicing herbalist. Welcome both of you on Hi. Smart Sustainability. Great to have you on. Thank you so much for having us. We're really glad to be here and have yeah, great this discussion. Here. It's a very important topic, so let's dive right in. What is actually naturopathy? Sarah, I want to start with you on that one. Sure. What do we understand by it? Yeah, so naturopathic medicine is a whole system of medicine that approaches the person as a whole system and encompasses using natural approaches as a first line of treatment rather than um, going for more invasive methods. Mm -hmm. um, it does include conventional approaches as well though, mm -hmm. so it's the best of both worlds. Now when you talk about whole system, what does that mean, treating us as a whole system? So instead of just um, thinking about one, um, a, a, one body system, instead of just uh, considering like, say there's an ocular issue, an eye problem, mm -hmm. instead of just focusing on that, we're thinking about what could be contributing to that. Mm -hmm. What's the underlying root issues feeding into that in terms of lifestyle and trying to get to the root cause. So it's not just symptomatic, like a cool. Band-Aid on there. Correct. But it actually looks to go to what's the actual root cause. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Now, Brian, what is a naturopathic doctor? 
what what are like it's what's the key characteristic yeah it's it? an important distinction to make so naturopathic doctors are the group of naturopathic healers who actually went to a four-year or five-year postgraduate education and got a doctoral degree in naturopathic medicine mm -hmm. um, this includes doing all the basic science it's very much modeled after um, the basic science and the education is modeled after sort of the MD curriculum. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, you're doing all of your anatomy, physiology, and all of the ologies and all that specific system based. You know, as Sarah just said, you know, a naturopathic doctor is always looking at holism, but in order for us to do that and dance in the medical system as we do, we also have to go and learn each of the systems individually and then go back and put them all together. So when you meet a naturopathic doctor who has gotten their degree from one of the accredited universities that offers it, mm -hmm. you can trust that that's the education that they have. They have this high tier, fully encompassing education. Um, so that's, that's the naturopathic doctor in a nutshell. Yeah, because you have to have an understanding of the of the of the fragmented mm -hmm. systems first before Absolutely. you're in a place of actually putting it back together. And moreover, if you're going to dance in the medical system as we do in licensed states, um, you're going to want to know every piece of that puzzle, including what is the Western conventional medicine way to go, so that when I add herbs or I add nutrition or I add lifestyle, I understand and can anticipate medically what's going to happen next. Now you started already talking about when we look at the medical landscape. So mm -hmm. when we look at the medical landscape, where though does naturopathic medicine fit in? Mm -hmm. How do we understand that? When we look at, you know, there's all the different types of medicine, there's all the different approaches, mm -hmm. where does it fit in? So naturopathic doctors in naturopathic medical school are taught to kind of fill the role in the primary care arena, meaning you come to me with an issue, mm -hmm. I'm going to help direct you within the medical landscape as to where you need to go, and you have this additional assurance as a naturopathic doctor, I'm always going to be asking, like Sarah said, what is the root cause here? What is this person's whole life like? Yes, okay, fine, they, they have high blood pressure, absolutely. Maybe they need to see a cardiologist, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And what else can I do to help them during that journey? Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's, a, it's a complete approach. Now, when you look at the landscape, though, so there's traditional medicine, mm -hmm. there is uh, naturopathic medicine. Most people would say they understand it as an either-or approach, but it is not, no. Sarah, right? Correct. And here in Virginia, most of the naturopathic doctors here also are working, are sharing patients with um, conventional medicine uh, providers, whether mm -hmm. it's a nurse practitioner, a medical doctor, osteopathic doctor, mm -hmm. and we're working together to support that patient. Whereas the medical doctors or the other um, providers that I mentioned are focused on a medical approach, naturopathic doctors are focused on supporting lifestyle in that patient and using natural medicines to provide a more comprehensive care. Mm -hmm. And um, in states that are licensed for naturopathic doctors, patients have a choice mm -hmm. of whether they want to see uh, naturopathic doctor for that primary care where they can get you know the conventional. So is this more like an overall assessment? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of where you stand health-wise right. as a patient? Yes. So we naturopathic doctors ask a lot of questions to try and assess what's going on with a patient mm -hmm. and we look at all aspects of health and then we come up with including a plan. psychological, mental, emotional issues. Correct. We ask about that, and um, we do provide motivational counseling and some level of um, support in that mm -hmm. regard in office. And if we need to refer to uh, um, additional behavioral health specialists, we're trained to do that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but we're considering all aspects of a person's health, including mental health. Mm -hmm. yeah. So before we get into what are some key pillars, what actually is the origin? What does it go back? to? Does one of you take yeah, that question? I'd love to take that question. Yes. And so this is something that could absolutely resonate with you because I believe you're from Germany. And yes. so the roots of naturopathic medicine um, stem from the German nature cure and water cure movement, um, which is still rich in um, Germany today. There mm -hmm. are still many water cure facilities. And yes. um, they're what? actually, just, just to inject that, they're mm -hmm. actually a major, uh, uh, widely available public health mm -hmm. resource that people can go to. And Actually, even health insurance pays for it. Yes, I know it's amazing, but they actually do. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's uh, wonderful. And so the um, founder of naturopathic medicine in America was Dr. Benjamin Lust, mm -hmm. who trained with um, Father Sebastian Neip mm -hmm. in, in Germany, and he mm -hmm. brought a naturopathy to America and um, 
trademark the term and um, the first naturopathic schools were opened, um, the first in New York City actually. I'm from New York State originally. Mm -hmm. so. So what would you consider some key pillars, so just that we mm -hmm. understand it, what would you consider some key pillars of, mm -hmm. of naturopathic medicine? Mm -hmm. So that's a very foundational question, and to that nature we say we have the foundations of naturopathic medicine. Um, and this is all about the foundations of health. So mm -hmm. if you come in with any problem from I have anxiety to I have knee pain, we're still going to say, are you sleeping? What's the diet? What's, who are you? We have to remove obstacles to cure before cure, because the body heals itself, right? Mm -hmm. as, a, as an naturopathic doctor, hot take, I've never healed anyone in my life. The body heals itself, and it's my job to help that facilitate that happening. And in order to do that, that's that foundational naturopathic approach of removing obstacles to cure, figuring out what your body wants and doesn't want, and helping educate you and empower, empower you mm -hmm. to make those decisions, and then, 50% of the time, the additional things that are needed, the surgeries, the NSAIDs, the herbs, you know, curcumin mm -hmm. for your knee, you don't end up needing it. Sometimes 50% will, and then 50% will just go, I changed my diet and did yoga, and it's all gone. And that's, that's the naturopathic approach. So it starts, though, from a different starting point. The different starting point mm -hmm. is from when, the, if I heard you correctly, mm -hmm. is it starts from, from the, the assumption or the point in place that the body heals itself. And that the idea of the medicine is to support this, your body in its mm -hmm. role to actually heal itself. Precisely. Which, of course, then also explains how it's complementary to traditional medicine because mm -hmm. there are sometimes things where, mm -hmm. y you know, sometimes oh, intervention absolutely. is necessary and, mm -hmm. and sort of prescribed and sometimes the best way to go mm -hmm. forward. But you have a different starting point. You trust in the body 100%. very differently than going normally and say, mm -hmm. well, I got something and here's something you do with mm -hmm. it and that's it. Exactly. Right? Correct, yeah. So let's talk for a moment about licensing. So, so because can anyone be a naturopathic doctor? In Virginia right now, anyone can call themselves a naturopathic doctor or a naturopath without any training whatsoever um, because there is no licensing and no um, standards or regulation in Virginia. Mm -hmm. So how do I know as a patient, um, for example, that someone is legit or that it's a good place to go to? Unfortunately, right now, um, the burden is put on the patient and patients don't have a great way of discerning this. And so um, we try to educate, as the Virginia Association of Naturopathic Physicians, VAAMP.org, we try to educate people about how to find a medically trained naturopathic doctor by looking to see if a naturopathic doctor went to one of the accredited CNME accredited universities um, took licensing exams, maintains a license in another state, but right now that burden um, for uh, safety is put on the patient unfairly. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there is a standard. There are standards and licensing mm -hmm. um, and regulation helps to um, provide some public safety. And right. right now that's missing, a missing piece in Virginia that mm -hmm. as an association we've been working on for 17 years, yeah. trying to gain recognition through licensure for naturopathic physicians in Virginia. Yeah. Yeah. But isn't that a little bit similar also to going to a regular doctor, for example? But when you go to a regular doctor, a traditional doctor approach, mm -hmm. and you have something, it still comes down to your own relationship with that doctor mm -hmm. and how much you trust in them. At least I know that's what I care about. Mm -hmm. I have to trust someone. And and if I don't trust someone, if, if I if I find a doctor or not, I, I cannot have a relationship because we are not sort of on the same page in how to mm. deal with my body. I'm not gonna go there. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, the, the, the patient um, practitioner relationship, I mean, is a truly important and sacred um, relationship. And right. I think that naturopathic doctors in particular I, of course, am biased, are, are certainly sensitive and realistic to that. One of the things I wanted to also mention is that the Virginia Association of Naturopathic Physicians on our website actually has a Find a Doctor tab mm -hmm. where the, if you're on the Find a Doctor tab or Find an ND, rather, um, tab of our website, these are, we have vetted them and, and confirmed okay. that they graduated from one of the accredited universities right. as well as passed their board exams. So something we didn't mention earlier is naturopathic doctors um, are, in order to get a license to practice, 
practice in the states that are licensed must pass a national certifying examination. Um, while Virginia may not have naturopathic doctors um, licensed and therefore the need to pass this board exam doesn't technically matter, we as an association ask that anybody who signs up through the VAMP has in fact passed that exam. Okay, now I do want to actually give this back to our viewers. So if you actually do look for someone, <laughs> there is a list you can go to to uh, the association's website and you can look it up and see if the person you have found or where to find someone that actually is accredited or licensed. So you have a little bit of a starting point at least mm -hmm. to dive into that before you go into that relationship. But it seems to me that's a great way to start. It's a good start. Yes. So, okay, now let's switch a little bit. So we cleared about what naturopathic uh, medicine is. We talked a little bit about, oh, one important question though mm. I do have about naturopathic doctors. So you mentioned before a naturopathic doctor asks all those questions. So mm -hmm. one could argue that if, even if you go to a dentist, you get a form and you fill out equally all these things. Mm -hmm. But I have a feeling no one ever looks at that form, so I <laughs> fill this out and it's kind of like I can do this blind and it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. What is different mm -hmm. to that approach when a naturopathic doctor looks at that? Uh, I think the simplest answer is that we actually do read those responses <laughs> and moreover we're pretty used to people blindly filling them out and then being like really so everything is perfect but you have a problem and they're like I'm like how's your sleep and they're like amazing I'm like is it though well you know six hours a day is fine and so forth and on so we take it we go over it again um, yeah. and that's the most important part and how does this relate to medicine, though? Does a naturopathic doctor also prescribe uh, drugs? What type of drugs, for example, is mm. their preference? Or can it also be, do you have accessible the whole range that other doctors have as well? So again, that's yeah. where licensing can come in handy. <laughs> um, so it really depends on the state you're located in. Here in Virginia, there's not licensing, so we don't have pharmacy at our disposal. Um, however, we can educate patients on if a pharmaceutical might be needed or recommend it to have, bring that um, back and have a conversation with our primary care doctor about it. Whereas in other states um, where there is a fuller scope of practice, uh, naturopathic doctors can help manage those uh, pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. Now, primary, we talked about primary care doctor. Does that also mean if, for example, you fall down the stairs and you have a concussion and you don't have a primary care doctor, is that also something you could identify a primary care doctor to start that relationship with? Um, so if my patient, I, I encourage most of my patients in Virginia to have a primary care doctor already mm -hmm. since acute care is not um, part, part of, of my mm -hmm. scope here in Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, but in other states um, where naturopathic doctors are the primary care provider for that patient, they can definitely help to address that. You know, they, they might recommend a referral to ER if it's an, uh, uh, an emergent or urgent situation for sure. Mm -hmm. so which really is sort of the long-term relationship in general. Now I want to switch gear a little bit and talk about our immune system because that I think is pretty yes. much at the core of the, the naturopathic approach and sometimes very forgotten. So let's start with the, the plain basics. Most of us when we hear our immune system, well we know a little bit about this but to varying degrees. So what is our immune system. Brian, you want to take that? Sure, big, big question. Yes. Um, so our immune system. So our immune system, of course, is like you said, what people think. The thing that fights the germs and the stuff on the outside of our body. It's more than that. It's also what helps restructure our body. It's what helps heals our body. It's part of how we survey the world around us um, through the normal and natural interaction with us and the microbial life around us. So the immune system plays many pivotal roles in just overall your body's awareness of what's going on internally and externally. So when you say your body's awareness of what's going on internally and externally, so to me, I would call this, this is my perception, but mm -hmm. I would not necessarily make the connection that that's my immune system. So how does that tie into your immune system? Or is the immune mm -hmm. system something that kind of is sort of like the radar, like, you know, when insects have the radar and they kind of have the feelers out and mm -hmm. they see, oops, what's all out there, danger, 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 mm -hmm. and that's how it reacts. So how do we, how do we imagine that? The beautiful part is that the reason you have to imagine and stretch your mind is because your immune system is working so well. Because it sees and touches and feels things that might be threats in a petri dish, mm -hmm. but it just handles it. And it creates memories that, again, you never even notice. And then there's the ones, the, you know, the ones we focus on, pathogens that get in and can reproduce in the body and cause 
disease. Mm -hmm. And that's when we see the more traditional way that people associate the immune system pop out, right? The fever, the response, the, the galvanizing of all our resources. And mm -hmm. then, of course, feeling cruddy. Um, and that's one of the powers of our immune system and, in, and a, obviously a very, very important part. How do you notice, though, the power of your immune system, that first part of, of its role, so the perceptive mm -hmm. part, so to speak, how do you know or realize that this is in your body and that it's working? Is there like a reaction in your body sometimes that kind of comes on? Sure, you could think about it when you get ill and you start manifesting symptoms of the chills or uh, um, fever, that's our immune system mm -hmm. responding to uh, the critter that's, uh, that it's, uh, your immune system is fighting against. So it's just those natural responses that some people, um, I think, become fearful of, but it's just your normal body's, um, your body's normal way of responding to a threat. Okay, that brings up the question. So when sometimes, you know, when you get nauseous on something and you, or you, you start getting really ill, you get sick, you start vomiting. In most cases, your body knows sort of like mm -hmm. what it was instinctively because it's like if you think of that certain thing it just brings it back up does that tie into the same thing it ties into the immune system and the whole concept of cellular memory for sure now there is a certain aspect that i could argue is psychological like psychosomatic which mm -hmm. is you know oh i'll never eat that again because of that experience that's a learned behavior mm -hmm. however on top of that your immune system is prepared for the illnesses you've seen before and will be able to mount a much more appropriate response. Mm -hmm. um, but a good example is when you look at people who are immunocompromised. So mm -hmm. all of, you know, as I said before, your body fi fights off or deals with so many things and you don't even notice. Maybe at best you feel a little fatigued, but you're just like, maybe I had a long day. But for those who are immunocompromised, some of these background noise critters mm -hmm. can completely take hold because there is no immune system there. So that's kind of a way for you to say like, what, you know, how do I know my, bo my body's always doing this thing? It's, it's beautiful if you're not noticing it. It means your body's healthy. Mm -hmm. So, but then there's also the other thing that you have, for example, autoimmune diseases mm -hmm. where the body kind of destroys its own immune system. Mm -hmm. When does that come into play? Well, I would say, <laughs> Often, um, many people have various autoimmune diseases, and it doesn't mean that um, their ability to respond to infectious disease is completely impaired. Mm -hmm. So you can have autoantibodies against uh, thyroid tissue, and sometimes mm -hmm. uh, that might uh, relate to uh, uh, hereditary, uh, for her hereditary reasons, or environmental reasons, mm -hmm. or um, possibly um, uh, allergy issues can mm -hmm. even play a role in that. Um, but um, nonetheless, you can still support a healthy immune function um, with those, um, with many of those autoimmune conditions that are going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now there is, I believe, a difference between something that's like a learned, Im there is like learned immunities mm -hmm. and there are innate immunities which Correct. we're born with, right? Mm -hmm. Let's do the distinction first. What's what actually? Okay. Sure. For the innate immune system, that is the immune immunity that you were born with. And so that- And that varies from people, from person to person? No, everyone is born with an innate immune system. Okay. So they come into the world and they have an ability, um, unless there's some uh, genetic reason that they mm -hmm. weren't born with this, mm -hmm. and there's cases of that, but mm -hmm. by and large, most of us are born with this innate immunity mm -hmm. where we have white blood cells called um, macrophages that are able to uh, identify various critters mm -hmm. and kind of encapsulate them and um, take care of them, destroy them. And so that is, you know, mm -hmm. one of the beautiful ways that our immune system functions. And do you want to take the adaptive sure. immunity, Brian? Yeah. <laughs> so we have we have the innate immunity, which is our surveillance immunity. It's also who's cleaning up your cut when you get a cut and has to break it down and heal it. That's all innate because it's going to happen no matter what. The other thing that, when uh, like uh, Sarah said, the macrophages are antigen-presenting cells. So they eat up stuff and they take proteins and they go over to the adaptive immunity. That's your B cells and your T cells, mm -hmm. and it give it presents that antigen is presented to that part of the immune system, and that. That's that one who's learned. And if it's seen this before, it's going to have a very quick response, and this is going to usually make the disease very mild. Um, in most cases, there's variants, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and if it hasn't, it has to learn. So in the time it takes for it to learn, so it presents this thing, and the immune system says, I've never seen that before, I've got to amp up. Unfortunately, the, the bacteria or the virus that's in your body has that time to replicate and get going. And that's where you see those more uh, pronounced 
uh, diseases. And in the case of viruses, such as the flu, this is a virus that's very capable of mutating and mm -hmm. getting around that adaptive immune response. But does then actually that mean also that our immune system, because there are some aspects of the flu, for example, that probably are already in our cells, yep. that you adapt faster? So in other words, does our immune system mm -hmm have also the learning curve mm -hmm. of adapting faster than, than, it, yeah. than if it were to start from scratch? Brand new. So the answer to that is a yes and no, and it's complicated in the sense that it depends on the mutation. Because mm -hmm. some, and, and you've seen this, right? You've seen some mm -hmm. years they're like, oh, the, you know, the, the new flu isn't that bad, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. And then other times it's like, wow, people are getting really sick. Mm -hmm. That's mother nature um, where she sort of determines how much our learned and our adapted immune system is able to respond to variants of a virus that's seen before. Mm -hmm. But we all have different responses, so which brings mm -hmm. up the other question is, so what actually influences, what are environmental influences that influence our individual immune system? My immune system may be completely different from yours and yours and somebody else's. So what what is the differentiator here and what is it influenced by? It's a great question. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we talk about the foundations of health at the start, mm -hmm. um, those are the things I think about as main influencers. So mm -hmm. sleep, stress, nutrition, um, including vitamin levels in the body, mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, movement exercise, those are big ones. Which actually makes us here in America extremely vulnerable exactly for those <laughs> reasons. Lack of sleep, a lot of them are stressed out all the time. Most mm -hmm. of us are running on the hamster wheel. Mm -hmm. And then and then exercise, okay, we could do better on that one too, and as overall. And right? then there's underlying disease states that you might already have going on mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. with um, uh, not quite a majority, but <laughs> edging up toward that way of Americans with either prediabetes or diabetes, mm -hmm. um, where the blood sugar levels are high, that um, does um, impair the healthy immune function. Mm -hmm. Is it fixable? It is fixable. We used to, I, th I think there was maybe some years ago where we didn't think we could reverse type 2 diabetes. Um, so for type 2 diabetes, we are finding that we can reverse it. We can mm -hmm. help um, people deal with their insulin resistance through these natural methods. So if someone hasn't heard about that and they would start at that point, for example, what would you tell them? What's, the, what's a good way to start? Oh gosh, again with the foundations, I feel like sometimes, I, I often say to my patients, I feel like I'm Dr. Obvious, but a lot of patients need that hand holding and support and they don't mm -hmm. often get that um, through the um, traditional systems. Mm -hmm. And so when my patients come in, they're getting an individualized plan of action and that helps guide their steps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's really interesting. Let's talk about though, how can we naturally boost our immune system. So we've we've all been through the last two years. They were challenging for everyone, I think. Um, and I, I don't even want to go into you know the the pros and cons and where we're at. So what I'm looking mm -hmm. at is we have our immune system. Mm -hmm. How do we build a better relationship with our immune system? How do we trust it more? Mm -hmm. How do we uh, sort of find a different approach to f be more comfortable that our body develops the response needed mm -hmm. quickly enough to deal with that, which of course also would lower, I ironically also the stress level, I think for a mm -hmm. lot of people and bring it down and sort of go calmer into whatever right. is gonna be thrown at us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's those are great series of questions. And in terms of there's a lot of fear right now where still a lot of people are afraid to be in community and around people, mm -hmm. but yet you're correct and that's how our body is exposed to different um, microbes and that's how our uh, innate an adapt, rather adaptive immune system mm -hmm. responds to those threats. But even just the basics, getting out and get moving rather than being isolated and being around people and in community can help to mm -hmm. lower our stress levels and help boost our dopamine and serotonin levels. Just the interaction and engagement with mm -hmm. um, community is so important and I think um, missing for a lot of people mm -hmm. in these past three years, uh, sadly. Yeah. Um, but um, hopefully as things start to open up, people can become more comfortable in that. Mm -hmm. And then um, obviously with um, uh, eating clean, lean and green, um, and also making sure our vitamin levels are adequate. You know, when we're trapped inside indoors, we're not getting that sun exposure that helps our body naturally produce vitamin D. Right. And there's been so much research on how adequate vitamin D levels help to prevent a serious 
sequelae or negative mm -hmm. outcomes right. um, from a, you know, from uh, like the COVID-19, for example. Right. So. So vitamin D, so we need more exercise, we need the interaction with mm -hmm. people, which also influences, of course, your psychological and mental state, which then, of course, feels, yeah. must give the body a whole boost because sort of it's, it's where, where it starts. Now, when we talk about the COVID impact on the immune system, I want to talk about two things separately here because I think we have to differentiate. So there is the impact of COVID, of the COVID shutdowns on our immune system, which means that mm -hmm. for many of us, our immune systems, and correct me if I say this wrong, they have to be adapting again or basically relearning, being retrained and, and basically mm -hmm. updating our own data, so to speak, mm -hmm. in right. what's out there, correct? correct. Yeah. So how do we do this? Let's talk about that. So is that where why people really need to go out and mingle and drop the fear and mix and interact? How do we how do we do this? Oh gosh, that's a good balancing act right now because yet we are still in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think within small groups, mm -hmm. that's a good starting place. You know, even mm -hmm. and you have to assess your own risk too, even with my own um, dear spouse has been dealing with some un underlying health conditions and yeah. When we're in a large group, um, we, we're going to be masked with N95 masks, absolutely. When we're in a smaller group of uh, people we, uh, that are, we're more intimate with, we're going to feel comfortable. So I think you have to do your own, you know, kind of risk assessment on yourself. Mm -hmm. and, under, and I think there's been so much education already through public health outreaches that people are aware of what the underlying risk factors are and to mind those. But for healthy people, I think some of that fear can be dropped, um, mm -hmm. and um, but still being cautious. <laughs> yeah, but but you you sort of go out. Now let's talk a little bit about how why we need to retrain the immune system. I mm -hmm. think we see this a lot in children mm -hmm. now that they go out more. They go on playgrounds. We see what are some of the consequences? Are some of the consequences that we do see more? other diseases and illnesses now because mm -hmm. you know at the beginning when we when we all went out you saw this myriad of mm -hmm. of new things that that kids mm -hmm. had like they had to get adapted to different mm -hmm. uh, things on the playground to germs bacteria etc is that a normal consequence that is a very normal consequence they are little <laughs> germ bags for a reason and we love them for it and it's just the fact that their innate and adaptive immune systems have plum not seen um, so many of these conditions and you know that's one of the be beautiful benefits of breastfeeding for instance it helps to provide a lot of additional immune support yeah. um, however you know once they're weaned and they're going out there it's it's expected and you have to kind of balance yeah. it and one of the hardest things for parents and I very much respect it is knowing where's the line how sick can my kid get and that's it you know they have to work with their doctor they have to work with what's in front of them just to make one other point though about like overarching, and this works for children as well, mm -hmm. but overarching ways to support your immune system and to make sure that it's kind of in tip-top shape um, is all about treating the gut. So you had mentioned uh, autoimmune conditions earlier, right. um, and we know that there is some leaky gut discussion around yeah. that as a potential of one of the ways it's getting generated. Yes. And so sometimes when people have immune issues, yeah. they're surprised when I'm obsessively asking them With about the their diet and mm -hmm. saying, do you take a probiotic? And what, you know, what are you eating? Because yes. um, you know, a huge portion of our in, uh, immune function is actually through our gut microbiome. And then also I wanted to add to that with one of our first lines of defense is our mucosal system. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the innate immune system. And so that's anything from uh, respiratory membranes mm -hmm. to your um, gut membranes in your stomach, which has stomach acid. But so many Americans are on medications that suppress their stomach acid. And that's one of the ways in which uh, we sterilize Microbes can be neutralized, exactly how we so can sterilize our food. So you basically weaken your immune system by all the, the anti-stomach Correct, when essence. you asked the question before about right. vomiting, I think sometimes right. your uh, taste buds can taste if they've uh, you know tasted something gnarly. I'm not sure if that's part of the immune adaptive uh, um, immune response or not, but definitely we have the stomach acid, which does neutralize things, and yeah. uh, that's mm -hmm. uh, an effective, another effective way, an important way, mm -hmm. uh, the minding of the gates. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's that's really really important. So it's a normal thing for us to expect some some d diseases as mm -hmm. we go forward because we basically have to get all out mm -hmm. and retrain our system. Fair to say. Fair, Fair to, to say. say. Yeah. Fair to say. So you heard it. So don't get shocked or anything else. We know we don't need to go hyper or go crazy when we actually hear that people get sick because it's a normal thing to do. We've all been under lockdown, so we haven't really had the exposure to other immunities. Correct. Right? Yes.
Yes. Okay, so that's a good thing to know. So we have the basics checked off. Nobody gets nervous about that. Now let's talk a little bit about um, the the how how the effect of COVID works on our immune system. So let's say there is another wave coming. Mm -hmm. Do I have to be nervous? I mean, how can I prepare? I think most of us, the majority of the population, has um, some immunity either through vaccination or through um, the innate um, natural immune system. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, we are. I think we are. Our bodies are somewhat prepared. Better prepared than last time. Yes, mm -hmm. better prepared than last time. Would you agree with that? I would say yes. It's it's tricky because again, once it, with the co with COVID in particular, we. It has, it's, I always say it's kind of like this roulette game. Mm -hmm. um, that's what makes this virus even more unique than you know the cold and the flus. It's this roulette where one healthy person is perfectly fine, the mm -hmm. next healthy person isn't okay, the person who's extremely ill it gets through it just fine, and then another person is changed forever with long COVID. Mm -hmm. And that, that rotation is something that I'm still working and studying on how do we try to predict it, which as a naturopathic doctor, makes me arc back into the foundations of health. The best we can do to be prepared is take the best care of ourselves. And the best care of ourselves is healthy food, taking care of the gut, mm -hmm. taking care of your environment probably, having the exercise, making sure you got sort of the vitamins. Do you have actually on your webpage, by the way, sort of like a checklist as to what to look for? I'm glad you asked that. Mm -hmm. We, our association, um, early on in the pandemic, we got together and we did a panel on immune support and resiliency. Yeah. And we have our resources, including a really nice kind of uh, summary of all that was discussed that's still pertinent today and also mm -hmm. the video. Uh, accessible to the public at no cost. Okay, so they can look it up. Yes, if they absolutely. Can go to, if they go mm -hmm. to the site, you heard it, you can go to the site, you actually can look it up. I think that's that's really uh, important to know so that it, we, we, we get a lot uh, a comma into that. Now I wanna talk a little bit about some, some other issues that I think have a lot to do with our trust in our immune system and, and our relationship to our body. Yeah. So, why is it that we have so little trust, or we had so little trust, mm -hmm. or some of us had so little trust, in our immune system, mm -hmm. um, where in other nations that was never a question because the first thing they would turn to is they would trust in their own body. Mm -hmm. So where is this discrepancy coming from? Why is that the case? Oh, that's a good question. And I think it's because um, some countries integrate natural medicine into their healthcare system, mm -hmm. and that has not been the case here in the U.S. Where um, for for some time now, mm -hmm. where um, we have an idea of this one-shot approach that started with the advent of antibiotics, which I'm glad we have antibiotics. Um, but after the advent of antibiotics, we started to look towards um, pharmaceuticals as a cure-all, mm -hmm. and we um, went away from. Uh, thinking about our bodies and um, natural ways to support our bodies. Mm -hmm. I'm thankful that um, we're starting to turn back toward um, these natural ways and um, we have more dialogue about this, much more research um, behind um, natural methods of health. Yeah, because that seems to me is sort of the key, but the other key is really the relationship to our body. And I've noticed, mm -hmm. so when I came to the United States, I tell a quick story. When I came here, mm -hmm. I sprained my ankle. I went to a doctor and the first thing he gave me was pills. And my <laughs> first reaction was, so I'm European, I was like, well, I have nothing mm -hmm. in my stomach. I have a sprained ankle. I need right. something for my ankle, just something external, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. that you could put on there. And, and the, what he said was, well, we don't, we don't have that over here. So, and that was, mind mm -hmm. you though, that was, you know, 20 years ago, 22 years ago, but still that was the first thing and I was so shocked that I actually asked my mother to send me stuff over here mm -hmm. so I could take care of my foot. Mm -hmm. yeah. But to me it was just not a natural, mm -hmm. taking a pill is not a natural approach. Mm, no. It's, uh, it's always fun because uh, as a, when I work with my patients, um, so often they are coming to me with this sort of like doe-eyed, like what can you do, what magic can you do? <laughs> because they have no idea what they're capable of or what natural medicine is capable of, but they are tired of not being getting the answers they're looking for. Right. And it doesn't take long for me to fish around in their story. And most often, you know, I can get a, a grandma's chicken noodle soup story, which is an herbal story, that's herbalism. Um, I can get a story my mom used to just 
just come That's downstairs right. with this thing. And, th and I'm like, you have been using natural medicine. You just never had it framed that way. And that begins that empowerment piece of I can't, my grandma did it and my mom did it. I guess I can too. Can it also be that there is kind of a different understanding that we somehow think that being progressive today, mm -hmm. and I don't want to use progressive in a political sense, mm -hmm. not at all, but in terms of thinking that sometimes that being advanced means automatically that has more technology and mm -hmm. more science to it versus actually understanding that the foundation of everything that exists is mm -hmm. nature. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, there's such a desire for scienceisms and things to come in and, you know, double blind placebo, but it's very hard to make a double blind placebo control trial of grandma's chicken noodle soup. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's one of those issues where we love research, we bow to the information it can give us, and also it shouldn't make us forget our past. Yeah, but, but there's also a difference, I think, that we need to talk about in terms of when you take a natural approach or a naturopathic approach, you don't have instant gratification. So when you look at mm -hmm. our lifestyle here particularly, most of us want instant gratification. You have to go to work, you have very few days off, nobody can really afford to be home, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et so when you look at this, what can we expect from a more naturopathic approach? Because mm -hmm. there is a time lag, right? Mm -hmm. You need to give it sort of some, some time mm -hmm. before it works. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the lovely thing about natural medicine is that I would say we are specialists in chronic care, mm -hmm. but we have a ton to offer in acute care as well. Mm -hmm. um, even just in my getting ready to come here, the lady who was helping with um, my hair and makeup was telling me a story of, you know, her drama and trauma of uh, an eye issue. Mm -hmm. um, but yet, when she used um, herbal medicines that were recommended by a healthcare provider mm -hmm. um, for her eye she was better in six days. So sometimes um, for some mm -hmm. of our chronic diseases, such as diabetes um, and uh, heart disease and um, whatnot, it can be a longer, slower um, approach mm -hmm. because we have to address mm -hmm. the lifestyle factors that right. are feeding into that. Um, but you know, sometimes natural medicine can work wonders quickly. I would say that um, pharmaceutical interventions are, are um, probably more tried and true for those acute issues. Um, so yeah, it mm -hmm. can take months. I, I typically, you know, I, for chronic issues, at least uh, starting to see improvements in three months. Mm -hmm. um, but a longer term relationship is what um, mm -hmm. naturopathic doctors mm -hmm. appreciate with their patients. Mm -hmm. But isn't that also a little similar to when you plant something? I mean, when you watch mm -hmm. a tomato, um, when, when you plant a tomato, you, you plant a seed, the tomato needs some time to grow too. It doesn't grow overnight. It's mm -hmm. not exactly that. You, you put something in there and oh, mm -hmm. there it is. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so you have to optimize the soil and the foundations mm -hmm. um, for that tomato to grow, you know, yeah. to the juicy, yeah. delicious tomato. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, nature, nature takes some time. Now let's talk a little bit though about how do people know when something works and is effective, particularly given that you need a longer time frame of mm -hmm. things, and when it doesn't. Um, let's, let's talk about first how do you actually know when something is effective and, wor and works mm -hmm. versus it, it doesn't work with your body? That's a great question. For most naturopathic doctors, we do a, a assessment where we're asking a lot of questions and mm -hmm. then we can reference back to that to see mm -hmm. improvements in all different body systems. Um, so when we're beginning to see improvements um, in things mm -hmm. like energy and mm -hmm. appetite and mood uh, and sleep, again, mm -hmm. impro seeing improvements in those foundations um, can help guide our steps. Also, sometimes we're taking a look at laboratories mm -hmm. and seeing changes mm -hmm. and improvements in those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But isn't it also normal that if you look at uh, naturopathic medicine, very often the first mm -hmm. few days it gets worse mm -hmm. and it's a normal part of the process. So it seems to me that understanding and knowing the process mm -hmm. is equally as important before jumping to the conclusion and saying, oh, you know, I took something and no, it's not working right away and mm -hmm. there's something wrong. Yeah. yeah, I think what you might be referencing is a healing crisis and I'm gonna like, uh, uh, ask Brian to maybe describe that a little bit more. Oh, healing, healing um, crisis. So it's basically speaking to this point that you know sometimes 
as the body starts to respond, you can feel a little bit worse. A good naturopathic doctor is going to ma roadmap that for you, where they're like, okay, so listen, like we're, we're working on your gut, we're trying to make it better. You might have some more gas and bloating, you might feel a little nauseous as your, your gut microbiome starts to shift and change and things die off and things change. This is normal, it shouldn't last more than three to five days maximum. If it does, please let me know. Yeah. Um, that kind of approach yeah. uh, is very much, you know, and the other side of course is, yes, we're gonna look at biometrics like labs and things like that when we can, but also everything is done hand in hand with our patients. So I'm gonna say, you tell me how you know you're getting better. Before we've even started a treatment, I'm like, how will you know you're getting better? Because I'm gonna watch for that too. Sometimes people can't see it, and it's my job to help be like, actually you are getting better because they don't see it. And other times I go, look, we did the, like, they're like, I'm doing it. I'm like, see? So I love setting goals with my patients to just say like, how will you know you'll yeah. feel better? Yeah, because I think that's, to me, that's a really important part. Understanding the process, to me, is, hard, if, is sort of half mm. of the rent, so to speak, right. because mm -hmm. then you know what to expect, you know what to look out for, and you're not being surprised and wondering and sort of mm -hmm. feel like, well, it's not working, and maybe I wasn't doing the right thing, and maybe I should have done something else, and maybe mm -hmm. I should have, I should have, should have, should have, so should have, would have, mm -hmm. and all this other stuff. So I think that's really important that patients actually know sort of what to expect and what's normal. Yep. Right? Yep, what's perfectly normal and healthy, right. including what's normal and healthy in recovery. Right. Um, and so it's so and it's so wonderful too because as I when I said like what oftentimes when a patient I ask like how will you know you're better there might be a pain mention or it might be this that but it's almost always a personal story I can go out with my grandchildren more I can do this and that right. having a goal that has an emotional tie-in is just as healing as any herb I can give you. Yeah. Now, when we talk about effectiveness, though, we have to talk about one particular thing. Now, there's a lot of arguments that uh, I've heard from people that would say, um, you know, uh, how do you know that the, the natural approach is effective? There's no studies on this, or there's limited studies on it, mm -hmm. and so on. Now, some of us would say, like in my case, I would say, well, I know in my heart because I, I just it's I intuitively know I understand mm -hmm. my body mm -hmm. but if you don't have that connection then you look more at maybe more scientific evidence and scientific evidence very often and we have the same thing overseas as well though we do believe heavily in uh, homeopathic approaches but obviously there is there is you cannot quantify it in the same way as you can quantify for example a drug whose purpose is just for one particular thing mm -hmm. so what would you say to that? Why is that the case? Uh, so with research in particular, this is a, we could do a whole other hour on it, but I'll try to be succinct. Yep. Um, when it comes to research and especially natural products, it's difficult for a variety of reasons. They usually do not lend themselves to the model we like, which is the, the, the double blind placebo controlled gold, gold standard of, you know, everything was kept the same except for this one molecule. That's a drug or a pharmaceutical uh, approach and it's very useful and effective at demonstrating that. Herbs, vitamins, uh, probiotics, yeah. most natural products hit more than one receptor in the body. That's by design, that's how nature works, right? That's all em encompassing and as a result we'll get kind of middle, sometimes we get grand slam results that we love and sometimes we get negative results that we have to acknowledge. But most of the time it kind of comes out as this needs more research. And that's because of the very nature that mm -hmm. these things don't really lend themselves to research. The other thing I like to say. So there's more complexity in it. There because is so they, much complexity. Because they affect more areas and you cannot just pinpoint it and say we're just looking at this tiny little fragmented dot. Absolutely. Because you don't have just the band-aid, you're looking at the actual root cause. Especially with botanicals, this is like trying yeah. to say I'm gonna play a song on a flute and I hand you a symphony you know right. that's kind of like there's so many players because yeah. there's so many phytochemicals per herb yeah. um, another thing I wanted to just point out is that um, no research meaning there is a lack of research in an herb or in a supplement does not mean not effective it means there's just been no studies on it right. and those studies I welcome please by all means we do struggle with the fact that it's not as financially viable to put because those double-blind, big, multi-center trials are right. big, big bucks. And for good reason. There's a lot of people that need to get paid to get that stuff done. Right. Totally understand. But when you're looking at echinacea, no one owns echinacea. There's not a financial incentive, and it gets very hard to get donors. So this also stalls out herbal research or yeah. natural research in so, general. So it's who funds the research. Big player. Who funds the research, what's the research for, and in most cases when research is actually done, um, 
sometimes it depends whoever commissions the research they have a certain mm -hmm. outcome in mind and so when you do the research you can actually tailor things to have a certain outcome mm -hmm. and then of course so so no financial incentives but then also I think what's really important to say is what you said that they're not comparable circumstances you cannot it's like comparing an apple with an orange because mm -hmm. you can't really mm -hmm. you can say they're fruits and they go in your mouth that's true. But that's but about that, it. It breaks and they, down. And they both have different effects on your body, by Absolutely. the way. And they interact differently with your body. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the main things. Okay, but we cannot derive um, the effectiveness from that. So what is your, what would be your main argument to someone and say, well, if somebody is sort of like on, 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 the, on the edge and say, well, I don't really know, you know, what's all the side effects and clinics and blah, 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 mm -hmm. but you don't have any of that and you don't have mm -hmm. anything on, on the effectiveness. So how do you convince a patient mm -hmm. to try something mm -hmm. um, when they're sort of like on the fence? Well, I would just say that uh, I would, most of the patients I see don't need convincing because the system that they've been mm -hmm. in has not served them for the chronic disease. And mm -hmm. so patients are looking for solutions outside of that right now. Mm -hmm. And also we do have a lot of evidence already, including through modern research, um, supporting a lot of these methods, maybe as not as much as um, some others, mm -hmm. but even a lot of the dogma behind traditional medicine has not always been well-founded in science. So, th so there's that too. Mm -hmm. And we can look to a lot of um, cultures or countries that do have traditional um, medicine incorporate it as a root foundation in their healthcare system and they have better healthcare outcomes than we do in the US. So um, th mm -hmm. th that speaks, I think, a lot of volume right there. Yeah, I think yeah. the Scandinavian countries are a prime example for mm -hmm. that. Right, and then we also know that yeah. the primary approach of pharmaceuticals is responsible for a significant amount of illness too. Yes. So and the side effects when you read the fast thing on mm. television, you know, to read to read the side effects, and you can barely mm. say like, blah, 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 it's really <laughs> fast, and then there it is. Right. Mm. And then they leave you in the dark yeah. as consumers. But I'm always baffled, actually, to what extent you can't really see the side effects, which actually brings up also another aspect. I do want to mention. I want to mention that for you as well, mm. because when you here in the United States, the way we get drugs administered, these little tiny little, you know, when mm -hmm. you go to the pharmacies and they give you these little these little uh, orange little things with a cap on it you don't really get much information on it whereas when for example in Europe you go and you get drugs mm -hmm. you get a whole package with ingredients in mm -hmm. that side effects in that everything else oh you, you get the package inserts in the US too mm hmm yeah the disclaimers yeah Maybe people don't read them, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, when you get them, it's like sort of just how to take them with instructions, mm -hmm. but it doesn't say much about the actual side effects, etc. I think the packaging is a major, major difference. Mm, mm. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah, because you'll get the bottle, and then the, the information about adverse effects is on a, a separate paper. So maybe that's the difference. It's not all in one. Yeah, because mm -hmm. it's like the whole thing. It, really, it literally says all the circumstances, all mm -hmm. the stuff, and yeah. you can siphon through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which makes for for me, I find it a much more educated consumer that way because you can read up a little bit more versus just mm -hmm. taking it and then and then doing that. So everything's in one package. And no, in it's Europe? like fully packaged. Like you have an actual outer box with everything listed. Mm -hmm. You have a full manual on the inside that says instructions. It also mm -hmm. says all the counter uh, uh, the the side the, the counter the side effects and and when it's not advisable to actually use the medication everything it goes on mm -hmm. for pages mm -hmm. yeah but it's there yeah we have those pages too but it's just not all packaged together yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's usually just folded up and put it in the bottom of the bag exactly <laughs> and people have to fish for it but yeah mm -hmm. um, uh, going back to just other things like about getting talking to people who are on the fence about right. about natural medicine right. um, you know one thing like I kind of similar to Sarah like I don't ever convince my patients of anything because I'm an advocate for them so if they're uncomfortable and they're like I'm afraid the astragalus herb is gonna hurt me oh no then we're not you know I, if you think something's gonna harm you it likely will just by <laughs> that uh, just the association and I do I see a fair bit of people who are very hesitant and unsure and I do yeah. my best to educate I remember doctor to be a doctor its root word is the Latin docere which means right. to teach and so I will continuously stand here educating and educating and helping people make the best decision for them mm -hmm. um, the hardest part I would say that I get cornered on is when patients say what would you do because it's not always the best medically ethical thing to say what I personally would do. Mm -hmm. So I have to like reflect and be like, here's the education. Right. But sometimes I just want to say how I feel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I, I, I believe it. Now you are 
uh, an herbalist, right? I also. am. So yeah, which is mm -hmm. the flower shirt, of course. <laughs> so I was also thinking, so in terms of when we go, as we go into the fall and we know a little bit more about our immune system, we know we can boost and strengthen it. We heard about there's actually something we can all do mm -hmm. to at least put us in a stronger position to sort of focus on it. And once you understand a little bit more how your mm -hmm. immune system works, then that also helps you deal with whatever mm -hmm. your body sort of confronts with, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when we look at affordability, when we look at other aspects of what we're in right now, so mm -hmm. we look at inflation, we look at rising prices, we look at who knows what's coming at us, mm -hmm. wouldn't it make total sense then to also understand more about plant knowledge and herbal knowledge to mm. be prepared and better so mm -hmm. you can actually have sort of a, at least if you don't believe in it but at least a backup yep. supportive system mm -hmm. that you can go to if things get totally out of control which Absolutely. we really don't know mm -hmm. and the best way you're going to do that isn't with some fancy herbal remedy i can come up with it's going to be kitchen herbalism, yes. your ginger, your garlic, your turmeric, your onions. These things are yummy and tasty, yeah. but they all are studied for helping the immune fun helping immune function in particular. Um, so those are just for off the top of my head, um, making sure you have cayenne, thyme, cilantro, right. all of those volatile herbs, like the ones that have lots of smell, those absolutely help to take care of your sinuses. Okay, hang on, let's let's repeat that. So we have okay. cayenne, we have cilantro, we have turmeric, we have, what else? Ginger, onions, ginger, onion, ginger onion, garlic. 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 Yep. Um, ginger, onion, garlic, uh, turmeric, uh, anything that is scented, your dill, your fennel, um, thyme, oregano in particular, those are very good. So really it would be very advisable for everyone to <laughs> stock up on your kitchen <laughs> shelves in terms yes. of herbs and, and other things that, that mm -hmm. you would do and also honey. for us. And honey yeah. to be um, a lot better prepared. So we're almost out of time. So I'm going to give you the last word on that. If you, what were your advice for people going into the fall? What would you like them to take from the show? Oh, um, well, to mind, don't neglect the basics of health. Make sure you're moving, interacting with people, getting adequate sleep, um, and getting on a routine. I think a lot of people depend on um, outdoor exercise during the summer, and then once the fall hits, they're totally unprepared. Mm -hmm. So planning for the fall season, um, getting stocked up mm -hmm. with those um, kitchen herbs if, if you're not engaging in your cuisine that way. So that would be a great start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And any, any last word from you, Brian? Uh, buy a wonderful and healthy probiotic.